Hey everybody. So um, we were discussing fallacies some more in chapter seven. And one of the more prominent fallacies uh, that we'll see used in debate, used in, uh, in politics, is the ad hominem fallacy. So let's take a look at the following argument. So according to Al Gore, global warming is the most serious threat facing us today. Folks, what a crock. Al Gore spends 20000 each year on electricity in his Tennessee mansion. So if we take a look at this argument, it's really based, well, let's first discuss the issue. The issue is about global warming, whether or not it's the most serious threat facing us today. And the person giving the argument, um, their reason to believe that global warming is not the most serious threat is this notion that Al Gore spends 20,000 each year on electricity, right? So that's their reason for believing global warming is not a serious threat. Now, obviously, hopefully you can see that that's not a reason to not believe in, in global, that's not a reason to deny global warming, right? Um, this, as we mentioned before, is a, a form of pseudo reasoning. It's not actual reasoning, but just a, a series of claims made to sound like some sort of argument. And instead, what we have is a fallacy. It's a mistake in reasoning for somebody to believe that this premise that Al Gore spends 20,000 each year on electricity is an actual reason to not believe in global warming. Okay, so if we take a look at what you know actual premises could be, well, we would take a look at sea levels, we take a look at coral reefs, we can take a look at CO2 levels, we can take a look at global temperatures, right? And those would all be related to reasons to believe in global warming or to say, hey, look, there is no effects, um, there are no effects of this thing called global warming, so it doesn't exist. But Al Gore's electricity bill you know, obviously is not a reason to believe or not believe in global warming. What it does, though, is it kind of puts a um, uh, it, it puts a question on the credibility of of a source, right? So if if the only thing you knew about global warming is whatever Al Gore tells you, and somebody questions Al Gore's motives, somebody questions Al Gore's uh, trustworthiness, uh, his his, uh, his knowledge, then they're questioning his credibility. Um, but just because somebody is not credible doesn't mean what they're saying is not true. In other words, just because somebody is a fool does not necessarily make what they say foolish. So um, you could have somebody who is, uh, by all accounts, uh, unreliable, uh, somebody that lies all the time, somebody that has no education, um, and they may say that they may make a statement like, you know, one plus one equals two. Now, obviously, for most of us, that seems like a, an obvious truth, and it doesn't matter how credible or not credible the source is, right? The truth is the truth in this case. So th this is um, this is where the misunderstanding comes into play. This is why we can often get fooled. Is we talked all uh, a couple weeks ago about credibility. We've been focusing on, you know, when somebody makes a claim. Well, let's take a look at the credibility of the source. And now we're talking about how well just because the source is not credible doesn't mean what they're saying is not true. So make sure you pay attention to what it is they're actually saying in addition to whether or not we want to believe the claims they make. So if we take a look at the whole global warming argument, if there's a person and they talk about how there are uh, rising sea levels, they talk about how there's rising um, uh, CO2 levels, and then we look at the credibility and, and find out that they're not very trustworthy or that they may be biased or that they may not have the expertise uh, in that sort of uh, field of science. Then we can question whether or not their claims are true or false. Um, but the argument somebody makes, uh, we have to look at the argument itself, right, to see if that logic works. And an argument based upon somebody being not credible doesn't necessarily make the argument not true okay so i know that might be a little difficult to comprehend at first but let's take a look at some more of these sorts of fallacies right so this is a, what's referred to as an ad hominem fallacy an ad hominem fallacy is when we attack the person that's speaking we talk the, a, a person that's making claims instead of attacking the claim itself right instead of attacking the argument itself so more formally it's confusing the quality of a person making a claim with the quality of the claim. So there are a few different types 
um, of ad hominem fallacies that we'll, we'll take a look at. But they all avoid actually addressing the argument and instead attack the person making the argument. So you can imagine somebody that has um, a, a strong opinion and they hear uh, an argument that's against their opinion. If they don't really have anything to say, if they don't really under, don't know how to combat or to to respond, they may just attack the person that's making the counter argument, right? It's an easier thing to do than to think carefully about what it is um, that's wrong with an argument that may actually be a correct argument. Okay, so um, the first ad hominem fallacy that we'll discuss is this is this personal attack ad hominem, and it's based upon not liking the person, right? So strictly about uh, our, our dislike for them. So an example, what Mitt Romney says about air pollution is a joke. That clan will say anything to get attention. Okay, so the issue here is about air pollution. And notice that this person that's arguing doesn't address whether or not air pollution is a problem or not a problem. Instead, they talk about how Mitt Romney is a clown. Again, it's a personal attack on the per uh, it's an attack on a person, right? Um, that's making a claim about air pollution, but it's not attacking the claim about air pollution. So it's a fallacy because just because there's an issue with this person, in this case, Mitt Romney, doesn't necessarily mean there is that what they say is not true, whatever it is that he's saying about air pollution. Okay, so this is based upon attacking the person. Instead of actually attacking or looking at the issue, they attack the person and say, we don't like this person, therefore what they're saying is not true. Another type of ad hominem fallacy is the inconsistency ad hominem. So here we discredit a person because they've changed their mind, because they have a behavior that's not consistent with what they are trying to argue for, what they're trying to argue about. Right? So, for example, Senator Clinton says we should get out of Iraq. What a bunch of garbage coming from her. She voted for the war, don't forget. Okay, so let's think about this. I mean, this is something we hear all the time in the news. We hear a lot with political pundits. The issue is about whether or not we should have gotten out of Iraq. Okay. Notice that the speaker doesn't address whether or not we should get out of Iraq. Instead, they discuss how Senator Clinton, somebody that says we should get out of Iraq, voted for the war earlier. Right. So they're showing that she has inconsistency. But just because a person has inconsistency, they've changed their mind about something, doesn't mean that the claim they hold, they, they believe now is not true. So to make it a clear example, if we say, um, you know, uh, John believed two plus two equals five yesterday. Now he's saying two plus two equals a four. What a bunch of baloney. Well, just because they changed their mind and figured out, you know, that what they said in the, in the past was wrong doesn't mean what they're saying now is not true, right? Two plus two seemingly does equal four. And it doesn't matter that that Johnny thought it was five yesterday. Now that they've changed their mind, believe it's four. Well, that's okay. We can change our minds. Arguing that Johnny changed his mind doesn't change the fact that two plus two equals four. Okay, so inconsistency ad hominem. Uh, another example of this, dad said smoking is bad for me. What a bunch, uh, what's that all about? He smokes a pack a day. Okay, so here are the issues of whether or not smoking is bad for you. And um, the, the, the child says, this person's behavior, right? Dad's behavior is, is not consistent with, their, with what they're saying because they smoke. Okay, again, just because a person's behavior is inconsistent or just because what they say is inconsistent doesn't mean what they're saying now is not true right if we want to take a look back at the the math example uh just because somebody changes their mind about two plus two equaling five and now they say it's four doesn't mean it's not equal to four okay again this can go to the credibility right this can talk about how what this person says may not be credible but that doesn't mean what they're saying is not true we just have to, if we really want to address the argument, we have to actually look at actual premises that address the actual issue at hand. And questioning somebody's consistency on an issue does not 
actually address the issue that's at hand. It's kind of a red herring in that way, right? Third type of ad, ad hominem fallacy, circumstantial ad hominem. Here we're taking a look at the circumstances and noticing that people will often discredit somebody by referring to their specific circumstances. So speaker says, what Al Gore says about pollution is pure bull. He makes a fortune from alternative energy investments. What do you think he'd say? Okay, so again, this is a valid critique of the person's credibility, right? Because obviously if they're making money from alternative energy investments and then they go on to promote alternative energies, there's a conflict of interest and they could obviously be biased, right? And they could obviously have an agenda. They may not be truthful because there's a reason for them to not be truthful. So this talks about their credibility, right? So we're trying to evaluate this person's claim, in this case, Al Gore, you're trying to evaluate their claim. Well, in the back of your head, you should be like questioning, making sure you realize that the credibility of this person may not be, um, uh, may, may not be as strong, but that does not mean what they're saying is not true. When we'd have to delve deeper into the argument about air pollution to figure out whether or not the claim the person makes is true or false. Right, but we have to actually look at the issue. We have to actually look to see evidence and, and to, to, to get a better sense for, for data about air pollution. Attacking the person that's making the claim doesn't necessarily uh, uh, provide an objection to the actual claim itself. Right, to provide an objection to uh, the issue of air pollution, whether or not it's a, it's a problem, well, you know, things like how much pollutants are in the air, you know, and talking about actual air quality. I mean, those would be things we'd, be take, we'd, we'd want to look at as part of the argument to, um, to confirm or to deny the, uh, that air pollution is a problem, right? Attacking Al Gore is not attacking the argument. It's not actually addressing the issue. So all of these, at least those first three, have this particular structure. Right? Somebody makes a claim, person A makes a claim X. Then the person that's trying to object to that claim, right? the person on the opposing side, person B, will discredit the person making the original claim. Notice that they're not actually discrediting the claim. They're not actually addressing the claim. Instead, they attack the person making the claim, which is often an easier thing to do. Right? Then person B, the objector, concludes that that first claim that person A was making is false. Do you see how this is a very common thing for people to do? Uh, it's much easier, again, as I mentioned before, to oftentimes attack the person that's making the argument as opposed to actually attacking the argument. One is because um, there's always going to be things about a person we don't like. <laughs> So it's really easy just to discredit the person. And two, when you are talking about individuals, people, sometimes it's much easier to get others emotionally engaged because they already don't like the person. You say stuff about politicians and there's going to be people that just don't like them based upon political affiliation. And because of that, they don't even look at the actual argument they're making about the issue that's at hand. Right? So something to really... Keep, a, keep in mind. Okay, fourth type of ad hominem fallacy is poisoning the well. And in this case, it's about giving a bad impression of somebody in advance, right? Before they make a claim. So that when they make the claim, when they make their argument, people are already discrediting them in their head, right? So you question the person that's arguing before they even make the argument. So speaker says, Senator Clinton is going to give a talk tonight on Iraq. Well, it's just going to be more baloney. That gal will say anything to get a vote. Notice there's no mention of the actual issue. All they're doing is they're saying something beforehand, before Clinton gives the argument, so that when she actually does give the argument, people are already questioning the validity of the argument, 
right? They're in their heads already saying whatever she's going to say is not going to be true. Right? That's poisoning the well. Okay. Um, so even uh, denial poisons the well. So before Dave gets a chance to make an argument, you say something like, I don't think Dave killed his wife. Well, okay. But, uh, but by making that statement, there's innuendo, right, which poisons the well, because now before Dave makes any sort of argument about something, people already have in their head, oh, my goodness, he poisoned his wife, he killed his wife. Um, again, this innuendo, which we learned about last week or two weeks ago, this innuendo poisons the well for the future argument that Dave is about to make. If we say something like Dave owns a cat, well, that's just a statement about Dave, right? That's not really poisoning the well unless you're talking to people that really hate cats <laughs> and so by saying dave owns a cat you are uh and you are talking to a bunch of people that hate cats well then automatically they may be um thinking whatever dave says is going to be false right okay well this is poisoning in the well um positive ad hominem is going to be kind of the opposite uh, poison, uh, positive ad hominem is believing that if a person or group has positive attributes, then we have more reason to believe their claims. Okay, so for the most part, ad hominems refer to uh, uh, attacks on a arguer, attacks on a person about to make a claim. Positive ad hominem is the opposite. It's saying something positive about somebody, recognizing something positive about the arguer, and that being the reason to believe them. He must, or he saved the children from the burning building. He must be right when he says aliens attacked us. Here, we're talking about the character of the person, right? Wow, he saved children from a burning building. And because we've placed the character of this person in good light, right? The speaker is using that as the reason to believe that aliens must have attacked us. Again, it's speaking to the credibility of the individual, right? It's speaking to the credibility of this individual that saved the children, but it's not actually addressing the issue of whether or not aliens attacked, right? There's no reason, there's no evidence concerning aliens. <laughs> Instead, we're talking about the person that believes aliens attacked us. We're saying this person saved children from a burning building. That has nothing to do with aliens. Right? So that's the fallacy. That's the fallacy. The NRA is awesome. So their proposal should all be awesome too. Again, if you have, uh, if you raise the NRA uh, up to be in a certain light, if we say that they're awesome, that has nothing to do with the quality of their proposals. That has nothing to do with what sorts of things they want to say is true or false about owning or whatever it is they, they believe in, right? Saying the NRA is awesome speaks to their credibility. It speaks to the character. It does not speak to the actual issues that they may support or not support, right? Hopefully that's obvious. I mean, here's the problem is that we are so emotionally attached that, and, and credibility is a big deal, right? That's why we spent all that time talking about credibility, that if we, hammer somebody's credibility, or if we boost up their credibility, our feeling is that what they say must be true, or if, they, if we're hammering it, then what they say must be false, right? It's good to be skeptical, skeptical. It's good to be skeptical based upon poor credibility, but don't let that blind you from the actual argument that might be made. The actual argument, the actual, issue that they raise and the actual conclusion that they come to may be true but it's always good to have in the back of your mind that the credibility is not so good so maybe I should question their claims that's for sure something you should think about but don't let that blind you from actually listening to the actual argument that's being made six the genetic fallacy so here we're going to reject an idea we're going to say it's false because it came from a defective source. It came from a club, a group of people, a political party, some institution that we say, oh, well, there's something wrong with those people. There's something wrong with that group. That club has a problem. Therefore, everything they say must be false. 
Again, that goes to the credibility of the source, that goes to the credibility of, of, of the group, but it does not necessarily mean what they're saying is not true. Okay? So, for instance, does God exist? Of course not, says the speaker. That idea originated with a bunch of ignorant people who knew nothing about science. Now, we can say that um, that there that that the idea of God existent that existing comes from some people who did not believe in science because science wasn't around back at the point where we started to believe in God. But that does not necessarily say anything about God's existence, right? That is an argument about, or the person is bringing a claim up about the source, so we can question credibility. But just because the source is defective does not mean the claim that's being made or that was made from the source is invalid. Once again, we can make a claim like uh, uh, there was a bunch of people back uh, who believed that, um, that the Earth was round, um, and they were, you know, they, they lived without science. Therefore, what they're saying is false. Well, no. I mean, uh, people that lived before the advent of science could say a bunch of things, some of which were, were true, some of which were false. But just because it, just because they said it doesn't mean it's automatically false. Now, what if I gave you this sort of series of claims? John says God exists. What nonsense. He's just saying that because he works for a church. Now, here, we're not talking about a group, right? We're not talking about, um, we're not talking about a club. We're talking about John. So this would not be a genetic fallacy. What fallacy would this be, though? Well, we're talking about the fact that John must work for a church. Therefore, what he says about God existing must be nonsense. This is referring to the circumstances that John, uh, in John's life, right? So this is the circumstantial ad hominem. So this is the difference, right? With the genetic fallacy, we're talking about a group that, 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 that was the origin of something. Like a club that was the origin of something. Um, so we're not discussing a specific individual that was the origin of a claim. Okay. So let's review the ad hominem. First, uh, ad hominem fallacies all refer to fallacies regarding the person making the claim. So we attack the person making the claim. We say something bad about the person making the claim, and that's supposed to deny everything that they say. That's the reason to not believe the claim that they're making. Right. That's the fallacy here. So there's the personal attack ad hominem. There's the inconsistency ad hominem. There's the circumstantial ad hominem. There's the poisoning the well ad hominem. On the flip side, we have the positive ad hominem, where instead of um, instead of saying something bad about the speaker, we say something good about the speaker, and um, that is the reason to believe them. This is not an argument, right? This is just a way to get us to feel good about what the person who's about the person that's speaking, and as a result, sometimes we get fooled into believing then what they're saying is true. Just like with the first four, we get so emotionally engaged, thinking, oh, what a lousy person, that we're, we become convinced that what they say is false. Right? Again, not logical, not rational. So something to keep, keep in mind of, because this happens all the time. These sorts of arguments come up all the time. Uh, and then we talked about the genetic fallacy. Okay, what I'd like you to do uh, is take a look at exercise 7-1, and then obviously there's no group, so this is on your own. Take a look at 7-1 uh, at numbers 2, 3, 5, 6, and 9, and try to write it down the type of ad hominem fallacy you see being used there. Okay. Press pause and then come back and take a look at the answers with me. Okay, so hopefully you can press pause, and then you come back. Welcome back. <laughs> Let's take a look at the answers. So number two is the inconsistency ad hominem, and hopefully you can see that the person was um, was talking about the speaker's inconsistency. Hopefully you can see that the, the speaker here was poisoning the well and saying something bad about the uh, the upcoming speaker. 
Number five is a genetic fallacy. So you can see how this the, the group was um, being attacked and and the speaker was saying as a result of this group not being so good, then what they're saying is false. Hopefully you can see the inconsistency ad hominem in number six. And number nine, the, the, the speaker is talking about the circumstances of this person, this person's life. Uh, they're not really addressing the actual issue there. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, next class, we'll look at the midterm results, hopefully, and discuss that. And we'll look at some more fallacies. Um, keep your eyes open. Pay attention to what people say and how they say it. Uh, Ten bucks says you're going to run into ad hominem fallacies even within the next 48 hours before we meet again. Uh, it's a really common fallacy. Okay, see you guys on uh, our next class meeting.